Hi. My name is Dr. Ayaz Afsa, and uh, our topic today is uh, sampling part one. The quality of a piece of research stands or falls not only by the appropriateness of methodology and instrumentation, but also by the suitability of the sampling strategy that has been adopted. Questions of sampling arise directly out of the issue of defining the population on which the research will focus. So, researchers must take sampling decisions early in the overall planning of a piece of research. Factors such as expenses, time, accessibility frequently prevent researchers from gaining information from the whole population. Therefore, they often need to be able to obtain data from a smaller group or subset of the total population in such a way that the knowledge gained is representative of the total population under study. So this smaller group or subset is called sample. Experienced researchers start with the total population and work down to the sample. By contrast, less experienced researchers often work from the bottom up. That is, they determine the minimum number of respondents needed to conduct the research. However, unless they identify the total population in advance, it is virtually impossible for them to assess how representative the sample is that they have drawn. Suppose that a class teacher has been released from the teaching commitments for one month in order to conduct some research into the abilities of 13-year-old students to undertake a set of science experiments that the research is to draw on these secondary schools which contain 300 such students each, a total of 900 students, and that the method that the teacher has been asked to use for data collection, uh, data collection is a semi-structured interview. So because of the time available to the teacher, it would be impossible for him or her to interview all 900 students that is the total population of uh, the schools, and including all cases. Therefore, he or she has to be selective and to interview fewer than all 900 students. How will she decide that selection? How will she select which student to interview? Of which students to interview. If she were to interview 200 of the students, would that be too many? If she were to interview just 20 of the students, would that be too few? If she were to interview just the males or just the female students, would that give her a him, a fair picture? If he or she were to interview just those students whom the science teachers had decided were good at science, would that yield a true picture of the total population of 900 students? Perhaps it would be better for him or her to interview those students who were experiencing some kind of difficulty in science 
and who did not enjoy the science classes as well as those who are good at science. Suppose that he or she turns on the day of the interview only to find that those students who do not enjoy science have decided to absent themselves from the science class or session a lesson. How can she reach those students? So decisions and problems such as these face researchers in deciding the sampling strategy to be used. Judgments have to be made about four key factors in sampling and they are the sample size, representativeness and parameters of the sample, access to the sample, the sampling strategy to be used and the decisions here will determine the sampling strategy to be used. So let's begin with point number one that is the sample size. What should be the size of the sample? Well, there are four considerations as I just mentioned we are going to discuss in this uh, uh, session and on the topic of sampling. First one is the sample size. Number two we'll discuss the representativeness of the sample and number three access to the sample and number four the sampling strategy to be used. You can see in the diagram and uh, that is uh, a concept of a population versus sample. So population is in the green color here in a circle that is the whole population and in the square you see inside it shows the sample of that population. In other diagram on the right you see in the same way if we take the, the big circle maybe that would be a universe sometimes explain later on and then you have a another circle within this and then there is a blue circle inside this that is the representative of the population in green. This assumes that a sample is actually required. I mean if you have 900 students you can't interview all of them. So you have to take a sample of the population, total population of 900 students. In some cases it is quite possible that the researcher can access the whole population rather than a sample but in most of the researches where the data where the population is large there would be some kind of sampling. So what should be the sample size? That's our topic to discuss in detail today. A question that often perplexes or puzzles novice researchers is just how large their sample samples for the research should be. So there is no clear cut answer to that question. For the correct sample size depends on the purpose of the study and the nature of the population under scrutiny. However, it is possible to give some advice on this matter. Generally speaking, the larger the sample, the better. As this not only gives greater reliability, but also enables more sophisticated statistics to be used. Thus, a sample size of 30 is held by many to be the minimum number of cases 
if researchers plan to use some form of statistical analysis on their data. Though this is a very small number and I would personally advise very considerably more. But the minimum required in some of the research is if you have to apply any statistical uh, analysis, the requirement is 30. So researchers need to think out in advance of any data col collection the sorts of relationships that they wish to explore within subgroups of their eventual sample. So there would be sample, within the sample there would be different groups or the subgroups and what's the relation between them also determines the size of the sample. Then the number of variables researchers set out to control in their analysis and the types of statistical tests that they wish to make must inform their decisions about sample size prior to the actual research undertaking. So typically, an anticipated minimum of 30 cases per variable should be used as a rule of thumb. That is, one must be assured of having a minimum of 30 cases for each variable, though this is a very low estimate indeed. This number rises rapidly if different subgroups of the population are included in the sample, which is frequently the case in most of the uh, researches the they are not a homogeneous groups but subgroups within a bigger group. Further, depending on the kind of analysis to be performed, some statistical tests will require larger sample samples than the sample of 30s. For example, let's imagine that one wished to calculate the chi-square statistic, a commonly used test with cross tabulated data. For example, looking at two subcategories are the subgroups of stakeholders in a primary school containing 60 10-year-old pupils and 20 teachers and their responses to a question on a five-point scale. Uh, you can look at the slide. Uh, it shows 10-year-old uh, pupils should do one hour's homework each weekday evening, that is the statement, and on a scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Uh, there are two variables, 10-year-old uh, pupils' responses and uh, teachers in the school, their responses about this statement. So strongly disagree on the one end. So you can see that 10-year-old uh, pupils in the school said out of 60, 25 strongly disagree with the statement and uh, six teachers also disagree with the statement, strongly disagree. 20 students out of 60 disagree, four teachers uh, out of 20 disagree. Neither agree nor disagree, three students, two teachers. Agree, eight students, four teachers. And strongly agree, four teachers and four students. So they are basically in this, uh, um, they are tabulated in a, uh, two, two categories, are two types of respondents uh, or informants recorded here and their opinion 
on one statement. So the issue rising out of the example here is also that one can observe considerable variation in the responses from the participants in the research. So Gorad uh, 2003 suggests that if a phenomena contains a lot of potential variability, then this will increase the sample size. Surveying a variable such as intelligence quotient, IQ for example, with a potential range from 70 to around 150 may require a larger sample rather than a smaller sample. As well as the requirement of a minimum number of cases in order to examine relationships between subgroups, researchers must obtain the minimum sample size that will accurately represent the population being targeted. With respect to size, will a large sample guarantee representativeness? Well, not necessarily. In our first example, the researcher could have interviewed a total sample of 450 females and still not have represented the male population. Okay, will a small size uh, guarantee representativeness? Again, not necessarily. The, the latter falls into the trap of saying that 50% of those who expressed an opinion said that they enjoyed the science subject. When the 50% was only one student, a researcher having interviewed only two students in all. So in this way, to calculate in a percentage would be a bizarre concept. Furthermore, too large a sample might become unmanageable and too small a sample might be unrepresentative. For example, in the first example, the researcher might have wished to interview 450 students, but this would have been unworkable in practice. Or the researcher might have interviewed only 10 students, which in all likelihood would have been unrepresentative of the total population of 900 students. So where simple random sampling is used, the sample size needed to reflect the population value of a particular variable depends both on the size of the population and the amount of heterogeneity or variety in the population. Generally, for populations of equal heterogeneity, the larger the population, the larger the sample that must be drawn. For, population, for populations of equal size, the greater the heterogeneity on a particular variable, the larger the sample that is needed. To the extent that a sample fails to represent accurately the population in world, there is a sampling error. Sample size is also determined to some extent by the style of the research. For example, a survey style usually requires a large sample, particularly if inferential statistics are to be calculated. In ethnographic uh, qualitative research, 
it is more likely that the sample size will be small. Sample size might also be constrained by cost in terms of time, money, stress, administrative support, the number of researchers and resources. Borg and Gale, 1979, suggest that correlation research requires a sample size of no fewer than 30 cases. That causal comparative and experimental methodologies require a sample size of no fewer than 15 cases. And the survey research should have no fewer than 100 cases in each major group and 20 to 50 in each minor subgroup. So Bogen Gold advised that sample size to begin with an estimation of the smallest number of cases in the smallest subgroup of the sample and work up from there rather than, rather than vice versa. So for example, if 5% of the sample must be teenage boys and this subsample must be 30 cases, for example for a correlation type of research, then the total sample will be 30 divided by 0.05 or 0.05 that is equivalent to 600. If 15 percent of the sample must be teenage girls and the subsample must be 45 cases, then the total sample must be 45 divided by 0.15 that is equivalent to 300 cases. The size of a probability or random sample can be determined in two ways, either by the researcher exercising prudence and ensuring that the sample represents the wider features of the population with the minimum number of cases are by using a table which from a mathematical formula indicates the appropriate size of a random sample for a given number of the wider population. One such example is provided by Grisha and Morgan whose work suggests that if the researcher were devising a sample from a wider population of 30 or fewer, for example a class of students or a group of young children in a class, then he or she would be well advised to include the whole of wider population as the sample. So, Kuyushi and Morgan indicate that the smaller the number of cases, the smaller the number of cases there are in the wider whole population, the larger the proportion of that population must be which appears in the sample. The, cons the converse of this, or the opposite of this is true. The larger the number of cases there are in the wider whole population, the smaller the proportion of that population can be which appears in the sample. Sample size, <coughs> there's an example, so if you have uh, your sample, if your population, a uh, total number that is capital N is 10, your sample would be 10. If it is 15, sample should be 14. If total number is 30, the sample should be 28. 
if the sample is, uh, if the population uh, is 100, the sample would be 80. And if it is 200, sample would be 132. If uh, the total number is 300, sample should be 169. And if it is 400, then sample would be 196. And if it is 500, then the sample should be 217. If you have 1,000, then the number would be 278. If the number is 1,500, then the sample size will be 306. And if it is 3,000, sample size will be 346. If it is 5,000, it will be 357. Look at the slide, you will see that as the number, uh, total number increases, the sample decreases. And uh, the good example, you can look at the last two figures. If the sample is, if the total number is 3,000, the sample would be 346. And if you almost a double of it, or 60% you increase, that would be from 3,000 to 5,000. But the sample increase is just uh, 11, from 346 for 3,000 and 357 for 5,000. So they conclude that as the population increases, the proportion of the population required in the sample diminishes, decreases, and indeed remains constant at around 384 cases. Hence, for example, a piece of research involving all the children in a small primary or elementary school, up to 100 students in all, might require about 80% and 100% of the school to be included in the sample. While a large secondary school of 1,200 students might require a sample of 25% of the school in order to achieve randomness. As a rough guide, in a random sample, the larger the sample, the greater is its chance of being representative. In determining sample size for a probability sample, one has to consider not only the population size, but also the confidence level and confidence interval to new terms which I'll explain in a minute. First of all, uh, proportion of sample size to population. Here you can see uh, in a graph that you have the sample in black and it is uh, in a horizontal order. You can see at the bottom on um, x-axis as the sample increases, uh, so the population. Uh, the population is given in uh, y-axis and uh, in, a, in a vertical line. So it's 1,000, 2,000, and maximum 6,000, 6, uh, 5,000, and look at the, what would be the sample size. The confidence level usually expressed as a percentage. Usually it is in the form of 90% or 99%. So the confidence level is basically an index of how sure we can be. 95% of the time or 99% of the time. that the responses lie within a given variation range. A given confidence interval, for example, of 3%, could be either side 
positive or negative uh, it could be up or down 3% the confidence interval is that degree of variation a variation range for example uh, up or down 1% or 2% or 3% that one wishes to ensure I'll explain it with uh, an example. The confidence interval in many opinion polls is that uh, three percent. Uh, what does this mean? This means that if a voting survey indicates that a political party has 52 percent of the votes, then it could be as low as 49 percent means 52 minus 2 uh, minus 3 are as high as 55 percent means 52 plus 3 so a confidence level of 90 percent here would indicate that we could be sure of this result within this range of 3 up or down 3% up or down for 95% of the time. So if we want to have a very high confidence level, say 99% of the time, then the sample size will be high. On the other hand, if we want a less, less strict confidence level, say 90% of the time, not the 95%, then the sample size will be smaller. Usually a compromise is reached and researchers opt for a 95% confidence level, the midway, between the 90% and the 99%. Similarly, if we want a very small confidence interval, that is a limited range of variation, for example 3 percent, then the sample size will be high. And if we are comfortable with a larger degree of variation, for example 5 percent, then the sample size will be lower. A full table of uh, sample sizes for a probability sample is given in the following table, in the following slide, uh, with three confidence levels just mentioned, 90% level, or 95%, or 99%. And three confidence intervals, 5%, 4%, and 3%. Let's have a look. So you have the population in the extreme right hand, column and your confidence level in the second column that is 90 percent and confidence level 95 percent in the third column and confidence level is 99 percent shown in the extreme right column. We can see the size of the sample reduces at an increasing rate as the population size increases. Generally, the larger the population, the smaller the proportion of the probability sample can be. Also, the higher the confidence level, the greater the sample, and the lower the confidence interval, the higher the sample. So a conventional sampling strategy will be to use a 95% confidence level and a 3% confidence interval. There are several websites that offer sample size calculation services for random samples. One such free site is from Creative Service Creative Service Systems, that is on www.surveysystem.com, SS, S, 
scalc.htm. Another is from Pearson NCS, that is www.pearsonncs.com slash research and sample calc.htm in which the researcher inputs the desired confidence level, confidence interval, and the population size, and the sample size is automatically calculated. If different uh, subgroups are strata, which I'll be going to discuss sometimes down the session, are to be used if different subgroups of strata are to be used, then the requirements placed on the total sample also apply to each subgroup. For example, let's imagine that we are surveying a whole school of 1,000 students in a multi-ethnic school. The formula above suggests that we need 278 students in our random sample to ensure representativeness. However, let's imagine that we wish to stratify our groups into, for example, Chinese students 100, Spanish 50, English 800, and American 50 students. From tables of random sample sizes, we work out a, rumba, a random sample, such as Chinese population is 100, the sample would be 80. Spanish population is 50, sample 44. English population of 100 students, sample would be 260. An American 50, like Spanish, the sample would be 44. So total population 1,000, and the total size of the sample would be 428. Our original sample size in the previous example was 278. And in this case, it has increased very quickly to 428. The message is very clear. The greater the number of strata or sub subgroups, the larger the sample will be. In the previous example, there were homogeneous group. In this case, there is a substrata or the subgroups. So much educational research concerns itself with strata rather than whole samples. So the issue is significant. One can rapidly generate the need for a very large sample. If subgroups are required, then the sample rules for calculating overall sample size apply to each of the subgroups. Further, determining the size of the sample will also have to take account of non-response, attrition, forgetfulness, and respondent mortality, don't return. That is, some res participants will fail to return questionnaires, mortality, or leave the research return incomplete or spoiled questionnaires. For example, missing out items, putting two ticks in a row of choices instead of only one. Hence, it is uh, advisable to overestimate rather than to underestimate the size of the sample required to build in redundancy. Unless one has guarantees of access, response, and perhaps the researcher's own presence at the time of 
conducting the research. For example, prisons, when questionnaires are being completed, then it might be advisable to estimate up to double the size of required sample in order to allow for such loss of clean and complete copies of questionnaires or responses. In some circumstances, meeting the requirements of sample size can be done on an evolutionary basis. For example, let's imagine that you wish to sample 300 teachers randomly selected. You succeed in gaining positive responses from 250 teachers to, for example, a telephone survey or a questionnaire survey. But you are 50 short of the required number. This matter can be resolved simply by adding another 50 to the random sample. And if not all of these are successful, then adding some more until the required number is reached. Bogen and Gold, 1979, suggests, suggests that as a general rule, sample size should be large where there are many variables, number one. Number two, only small differences or small relationships are expected or predicted. Number three, the sample will be broken down into subgroups. And number four, the sample is heterogeneous in terms of the variables under study and number five reliable measures of the dependent variables are unavailable. With both quantitative, qualitative and quantitative data the essential requirement is that the sample is representative of the population from which it is drawn say in a dissertation concerned with the life history that is n would be equal to 1 it means the sample will be the whole population n is equal to 1 means the whole population would be included not a sample so qualitative data in a qualitative data and in a qualitative study of 30 highly able girls of similar social economic background following a, an A-level biological course, a sample of five or six may suffice the researcher who is prepared to obtain additional corroborative data by way of validation. Where there is heterogeneity in the population, then a larger sample must be selected on some basis that respects the heterogeneity. Thus from a staff of 60 secondary school teachers differentiated by gender, age, subject specialism, management, or classroom responsibility, these are the variables, it would be sufficient, it would be insufficient to construct a sample consisting of 10 female classroom teachers of arts and humanities subjects. For quantitative data, a precise sample number can be calculated according to the level of accuracy and the level of probability that researchers require in their work. They can then report in their study the rationale 
and the basis of their research decisions. By way of example, suppose a teacher or researcher wishes to sample opinions among 1,000 secondary school students. She intends to use a 10-point scale ranging from 1 totally unsatisfactory to 10 absolutely fabulous. She already has data from her own classes of 30 students and suspects that the responses of other students will be broadly similar. Her own students rated the activity an extracurricular event as follows. Mean score equivalent to 7.27 with standard deviation of 1.98. In other words, her students were pretty much bunched about a warm, positive appraisal on the 10-point scale. How many of the 1,000 students does she need to sample in, in order to gain an accurate, reliable assessment of what the whole school means n is equal to 1,000 thinks of the extracurricular event. It all depends on what degree of accuracy and what level of probability she is willing to accept. A simple calculation from a formula by Blalock shows that if she is happy to be within plus or minus 0.5 of a scale point and accurate 19 times out of 20, then she requires a sample of 60 out of the 1000. And if she is happy to be within plus or minus 0 0.5 of a scale point, and accurate 99 times out of 100, then she requires a sample of 104 out of the 1000. And if she is happy to be within plus or minus 0 0.5 of a scale point, and accurate 999 times out of 1,000, then she requires a sample of 170, a sample of 170 out of the 1,000. And if she is perfectionist and wishes to be within plus or minus 0.25 of a scale point, an accurate 999 times out of 1000, then she requires a sample of 679 out of the 1000. It is clear that sample size is a matter of judgment as well as mathematical precision. Even formula-driven approaches make it clear that there are elements of prediction, standard error, and human judgment involved in determining sample size. So what is a sampling error? If many samples are taken from the same population, which is unlikely 
that they will all have characteristics identical with each other or uh, with the population. Their means will be different. In brief, there will be sampling error. Sampling error is often taken to be the difference between the sample mean and the population mean. Sampling error is not necessarily the result of mistakes made in sampling procedures. Rather, variations may occur due to the chance selection of different individuals. For example, if we take a large number of samples from the population and measure the mean value of each sample, then the sample means then the sample means will not be identical. Some will be relatively high, some relatively low, and many will cluster around an average or mean value of the samples. Sample size, confidence level, and sampling error can be presented in, in a tabular form as in the following uh, table. Here the total number is 50 and with a 95 percent accuracy the sample required would be 44. If the population that is stands capital N is 50 total number and you need that 95 percent of the sample the sample size for that one would be 44 and if you want 99 percent accuracy the sample required would be 50 out of 50 in the same way if the total number or population is 100, with a 95% accuracy, uh, the sample would be 79. And with 99%, sample required would be 99 out of 100. With a total number 200, and sample accuracy with 95 percent sample requirement would be 132 out of 200 and with 99 accuracy it would be 196 in the same way if it is um, total number is 500 with 95 percent accuracy sample would be 217 and with 99% accuracy, the sample would require would be 476. Then goes into thousands. If it is 1,000, and sample with 95% accuracy would be 278, and with 99%, it should be 907. In the same way, if uh, the total number is 2,000, with 95% accuracy, the sample requirement would be 322. And with 99% accuracy, the sample number required would be 1,661. In the same way, if the total number of population is 5,000, with the 95 percent accuracy, the sample required, the numbers 357, and with 99 percent accuracy, sample required would be 3,311. Why should this occur? 
we can explain the phenomena by reference to the central limit theorem which is derived from the laws of probability. This law states that if random large samples of equal size are repeatedly drawn from any population then the mean of those samples will be approximately normally distributed. So the distribution of sample means approaches the normal distribution as the size of the sample increases regardless of the shape normal or otherwise of the parent population. Moreover, the average or mean of the sample means will be approximately the same as the population mean. The average or mean of the sample means will be approximately the same as the population mean. Hopkins et al. 1996 demonstrate the same phenomena by reporting the use of computer simulation to examine the sampling distribution of means when computed 10,000 times. So by drawing a large number of samples of equal size from population, we create a sampling distribution. We can calculate the error involved in such sampling. The standard deviation of the theoretical distribution of sample means is a measure of sampling error and is called the standard error of the mean, SEM. Standard error of the mean. So the standard error could be uh, written in a formula that is SE, standard error, is equivalent to SDS divided by under root n, where SDS is the standard deviation of the sample and n is the number in the sample, total number. Strictly speaking, the formula for the standard error of the mean could be rewritten as standard error that is SE is equal to standard deviation of the population SDPP standard deviation of the population divided by under root N. So here in this uh, slide you will see a normal distribution and here uh, distribution of sample means showing the spread of a selection of sample means around the population mean. So population mean would be in, in the center over here in this area. So the, it's shaped like a bell here and the mean of population is around the mean of the population in exactly in the middle. So MPP, MPOP is a population mean and MS is the sample means. The sample means MS over here and then the population mean in the middle which is bunched together in, in a bell shape normal distribution. However, as we are usually unable to ascertain 
the standard deviation of the total population. The standard deviation of the sample is used instead. The standard error of the mean provides the best estimate of the sampling error. Clearly, the sampling error depends on the variability that is the heterogeneity in the population as measured by uh, standard deviation of population as well as the sample size reported by reported in Rose and Sullivan 1993. So the smaller the standard deviation population the smaller the sampling error. The larger the total number the smaller the sampling error where the standard deviation of the population is very large then total number needs to be very large to counteract it where standard deviation of the population is very small then n that is the total number 2 can be small and still give a reasonably small sampling error. As the sample size increases, the sampling error decreases. Hopkins et al. suggests that unless there are some very unusual distributions, samples of 25 are greater, usually yield a normal sampling distribution of the mean. So for further analysis of steps that can be taken to cope with the estimation of sampling in surveys, I'll suggest you to see Ross and Wilson, 1997. Well, this was uh, about sampling and sampling is very important factor in any kind of research and especially uh, if it is a positivistic or a quantitative type of research. Sampling in simple words means that you can't work on all the cases which are in the form of a population. You need to take a certain number out of the total population. And this session was about how can you do that? How big your size can be? Well, the answer was not simple because it depends on a number of factors. And those factors were basically depend on what type of study or what is your research question. Well, the sampling is important for all types of research, whether it is quantitative or qualitative one. And the minimum requirement for any significant application of statistics requires that any sample shouldn't be less than 30. Otherwise, no significant statistical analysis can be conducted on the sample. Well, we'll continue with this uh, topic, sampling part two, in which we'll discuss its representativeness and other aspects of sampling which a researcher should keep in mind while designing his or her research plan. So that is the end of uh, this session. We'll meet again. Thank you very much for listening.